We're continuing on our journey uh, today in the Old Testament on Route 66, the books of the Bible. And today we come to the book of Obadiah. Now, most of us don't read that book too often. And it's, there's several reasons for that. Uh, one is that it doesn't seem to apply to our lives today when we look at a book like this, but we're going to find out that there's more to this little book of 21 verses than we imagine. But it's a book that we can skip over because it's so short and because it really has an application uh, to the Jewish people and to those who live in a country near Israel, well, no longer live there because the country is extant now. Uh, and that country was called Edom. And so when you come to travel uh, down the road with Obadiah, you come to deal with two uh, descendants of Jacob, Esau and his brother Jacob. And Esau is the father of the Edomites. If you read the rest of the Old Testament, when you come to 1 Kings 18, you'll find that uh, Obadiah met with Elijah and was a part of his responsibility to call the prophets of Baal to Mount Carmel, where Elijah had that famous encounter with them, and God sent down fire from heaven to burn up the sacrifice uh, that the people of Israel brought and Elijah uh, sacrificed in, in the face of the prophets of Baal who could not get a response from their God, which didn't surprise Elijah or Obadiah at all. Uh, they expected God to answer with fire. By the way, one of the lessons that we learned from Obadiah is that God is always listening. God hears, and he in his own time, here we go again, talking about eternity and how we insert time into eternity, but in God's plan and in God's moment, he sends whatever we need in our lives, and that's one of the messages that comes through with the book of Obadiah. The name Obadiah means worshiper of Jehovah. If you have one of the newer translations of the Bible, you'll find that the word Jehovah is probably written Yahweh, capital Y, capital A, capital H, capital W, capital E, capital H, and it's usually written in the King James Version, Jehovah, so that we put in the vowels and pronounce the full name uh, Jehovah, but a Hebrew might have called it Yahweh, or he might have simply said holy, because this is the name of God's righteousness or God's holiness that the people knew. The background for the book of Obadiah is the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Jacob who uh, were the fathers of these two nations. And you remember that when Jacob and Esau struggled in their mother's womb, uh, Rebekah, the wife of Jacob, the, the beloved wife of Jacob, uh, gave birth to these twins. But uh, the younger twin, it was prophesied, would, would be the one who would rule over the older twin. And how that came about was when Esau had come in from the fields and was very hungry, he traded his birthright to Jacob for a culinary delight that J Jacob was able to make and that Esau uh, was really hungry for. When Jacob was about to die, when Isaac was about to die, I'm sorry, uh, Jacob and Rebekah worked out the scheme whereby they would put animal skins on the arms of Jacob and his father would feel the arms and recognize that it was 
like Esau, but not like Jacob. In fact, Isaac said, because he was blind at that point, it's the voice of Jacob, but it's the touch of Esau. Well, that conflict has continued between the Israeli people and the Arab peoples for now close to 3,000 years. So the struggle and now the uh, magnificent arrival and rivalness of the nation Israel uh, is coming to the forefront and that prophecy, the younger uh, will be served by the older uh, is coming true even in our modern history. Jacob blessed his sons later on, all 12 of them, with a certain kind of blessing. But Isaac was the one who gave Jacob the birthright that Esau despised, the book of Hebrews says. Well, this Obadiah then t takes this, the intricacies of this encounter between uh, Jacob and Esau and allows us to see something about how God uses the struggles of human being and turns them to blessings for us. So when you read the first nine verses of the book of Obadiah, you'll find that it's all about the judgment of Edom, the, the country that now is no longer there, but these are the descendants of Esau. They were eventually destroyed by Babylon, and now they're no longer extant in history as we know it. Verses 10 to 14 tell us about Edom's violation. There were two things that the prophet mentions in particular. One is that they did not defend Judah from the destruction that was coming from Babylon to the city of Jerusalem, and they allowed that nation, Babylon, to come in and destroy the city and to temple, to plunder the temple. And God held them accountable for that. And then finally, verses 15 to 21, God promises the restoration of Israel because his covenant is with Abraham and his descendants through Isaac and Jacob. Babylon destroyed Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Three years later, Obadiah comes along and makes this prophecy uh, after that destruction and calls Edom out to, to say, why did you not help God's people when Babylon came to destroy them? There's a key thought in this book, and that is, that those who are cruel, like the proud Edomites, will be judged, but Israel will one day eventually be restored in triumph. The day of the Lord is coming. Well, that's one of the key verses in the book of Obed Obadiah, and it's coming on all nations. You and I are going to be part of the day of the Lord that's the Old Testament uh, equivalent of the second coming of Christ. The day of the Lord, which is prophesied throughout the Old Testament, is a day of judgment. When Christ returns, he's going to judge the world for a thousand years after this bitter period of tribulation for the seven years while the rapture is taking place and the church is caught up into heaven. When you feel mistreated by others, Obadiah would look back and say, leave it with God. He sees everything. Rest your case with him, and eventually he will deal justly with all who are difficult for you to deal with. I think there's a prayer that's wound up, uh, embedded in the book of Obadiah. 
And if we could translate it into our modern language, it would be, Lord, give me a love for others that rejoices. Leave it with God who sees all. Rest your case with him who deals justly with people. And here's the prayer. Lord, give me a love for others that rejoices when they succeed, not when they fail. That's a hard concept for us, isn't it? When you and I are mistreated or when we feel God has abandoned us or God has left us alone, it seems, we want to get even. But God says, leave it to me. I'll take care of those who need to be punished. You be faithful to me. And that was the message Obadiah gave first to the people of Edom, God is going to judge you. And then to the people of Israel, be faithful to the covenant God has given you through Abraham and allow him to take care of all of your needs. And there's one other little thought that comes through in the book of Obadiah that you and I ought to remember. It says in Obadiah, don't despise the day of small things. Boy, couldn't we learn some lessons from that. We have a tendency to want things to be big, magnanimous, wonderful, gargantuan. And God says, no, what I want to do is to bless you through small things. And it's the still small voice through which God speaks to us and we hear clearly his message so often. If you're listening closely today, above the thunder, uh, above the whirlwind, when the quiet moment comes, God speaks and he may say to your heart, as he so very often does, I love you, my child. Whatever you're going through, I'm going to walk there with you. And that's the message of this prophet. With all of the, the symbolism of the judgment appeals, there's that wonderful promise. God loves you. And today, may you remember that God loves you. And so do I. I'm so glad that we can share together the wonderful truth of God's word. God bless you today.